Uh, hello. Uh, so glad to see all of you here for a really interesting presentation today. How many of you have been in the civil rights room at the Nashville room? Well, I, our speaker today, Elliot Robertson, has not only involvement there, but he's known personally a number of the Nashvilleans who were involved in the civil rights movement here in Nashville in the early 60s. This is something that Nashville gave very little information about our attention to for decades. It was a long time before they finally said, we need to honor these people. And that's what Elliot's going to do for you today. Elliot Robinson. Wow, thank you, thank you, thank you. I, um, let's see, oh, I need a little light. Is there, is there a light I can use on my, uh, for my, my script here? Uh, that can work, that can work. I was, <clears throat> I was, uh, I was tremendously honored when Mrs. Roseman asked me to come to address you fine folks the first time. And I don't even know what to say about being asked to come back other than thank you very much. I, uh, I don't get to join you for as many presentations as I, as I would like, but the ones that I am able to catch are always great. So I'm honored to uh, be deemed worthy of making a contribution to this very distinguished and very curious group. It's something I always try to instill in my own children, I always be curious. So today's subject is the Freedom Rides. I think it would be safe to say that uh, most of us in this room have at least some familiarity with this story. Uh, organized by the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, the 1961 Freedom Ride was a test mission <clears throat> to challenge the lack of enforcement of United States Supreme Court rulings against segregation on buses engaged in interstate travel, and also in bus station waiting rooms and restrooms and coffee shops. As was par for the course during those days, southern states had all boldly and simply chosen to ignore the rulings of the highest court in all the land in order to uphold the racist hierarchy of a totally segregated society and keep the black people in their place, in this case, that place being the back of the bus. Now, this was not the first time that CORE had helped organize interracial groups of citizens to travel together. In 1947, they worked with the Fellowship of Reconciliation and the American Friends Service Committee on the journey of reconciliation, meant to test the Supreme Court's 1946 Morgan versus Virginia ruling, which prohibited segregation and interstate travel as unconstitutional. With a very similar purpose, the 1961 ride was designed to test a different ruling, Boynton versus Virginia, which held that racial segregation in public transportation was illegal because such segregation violated the Interstate Commerce Act, which broadly forbade discrimination in interstate passenger transportation. The plan for the 1961 ride was like the first, place black and, black and white riders together as passengers on regularly scheduled Greyhound and Trailways buses. They departed from Washington, D.C. on May 4th, and the planned route would take them through Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, then across Georgia and Alabama into Mississippi with their final destination being New Orleans. Sounds like a pretty awesome road trip, right? Think of the sights that you could see on a trip like that. Anybody still take road trips? I, I kind of still like them a little bit, as long as they're four hours or less. <laughs> but the riders made it all the way to South Carolina before they encountered their first taste of violence. Uh, in Rock Hill, on May 9th, members of the group on Greyhound, including John Lewis, were beaten trying to enter the whites only waiting room. And the rioters survived, passing their first real test to their pledge of nonviolence, and they continued with their mission. On Sunday, May 14th, anniversary today, which was also Mother's Day, the rioters left Atlanta headed for Birmingham. When the Greyhound bus arrived in Anniston, Alabama, about 65 miles east of Birmingham, they found the bus station there had been closed and an angry crowd of whites was milling around. I had a little technical snafu with my slides, so I'm using an older presentation. I'll be jumping around a little bit. <clears throat> Members of the crowd in Aniston smashed uh, some of the bus's windows and they slashed a couple of tires while even some of them lay down in front of the front of the bus to prevent it from leaving the station. When the driver was finally allowed to pull out, carloads of angry whites followed the bus with some pulling ahead and slowing down, boxing the driver in. Six miles outside Aniston, the driver had to stop to try to repair the now flattened tires. Members of the mob who had followed from Aniston tried to board the bus but were prevented from getting on by an Alabama state investigator who had gotten on board 
acting on a tip of possible trouble. Someone threw an incendiary device, sold a bottle filled with gasoline, through one of the bus's broken windows. Then the mob tried to block the door, <clears throat> excuse me, so that the passengers could not get off the burning bus. The only way the rioters were able to get off because the bus fuel tank exploded, pushing the crowd back. A freedom rider, Hank Thomas, recalls what happened once he got outside. A guy came up to me, and by this time, you're reacting to the smoke in your lungs, and he just said, are you all right, boy? And I'm thinking, somebody's concerned about me. And I said, yes. And he hit me with what turned out to have been a baseball bat. I don't know why I didn't have a fractured skull. This quote comes from an interview uh, in a film called Soundtrack for a Revolution, which is one of the films we hold in the Civil Rights Collection. It's a really great chronicle of the major events of the movement told through the lens of how important music was to the whole thing. Uh, it was so good, I went to Amazon and bought it. But uh, after Anniston and more violence in Birmingham, no drivers could be found to take the Freedom Riders any further. So they ended up flying the rest of the way to New Orleans, and it was all over, right? Not quite. As many of you probably know, the Nashville student movement picked up the rides. And that's my main focus today. So as I was preparing for this, I, I didn't know, I, I knew I didn't want to come here and give you a comprehensive history of the Freedom Rides. You know, I wasn't going to do that. I, I work for the library, so I'm always thinking about how I can use our resources. And I had a light bulb moment when I watched the film and I heard that quote from Hank Thomas. And I wondered what kind of quotes I might find about the Freedom Rides in our own civil rights oral history project. And being a steward of the resources we house, I'm always looking for ways to expose people to our stuff. And it turned out to be quite the fruitful search. So what I'm going to try to present to you today is an oral history of when the Nashville students picked up the Freedom Rides after the Anniston bombing. Now, these were very young people who had already demonstrated a deep commitment to nonviolence on the heels of the successes they achieved during Nashville's lunch counter sit-ins in 1960. And here we are but one year later, and they're presented with another opportunity to prove that violence and hate cannot win. I'm going to try to tell the story the best I can using the words of the people connected to the events from the transcripts in our oral history collection and some from a program we, call, we had at the library uh, called Freedom Riders, the Nashville Connection, which was held in 2001, the 50th anniversary of the ride. I'm going, to put, I'm going to try to put their answers into the context of answering questions that I'm going to pose. So let, let's see how we do. Now, what was on the minds of these young people, the coordinators, coordinators of the Nashville nonviolent student movement? Surely the Merchant of Violence celebrated Aniston as a huge success. I mean, what a major, very frightening blow struck for the whole world to see, right? So surely they believed that there would be no other outcome than the whole idea of this freedom riding, freedom riding would stop. And then the news reached Nashville, and there were some very serious discussions that had to be had. So according to Archie Allen, this is when the Nashville students stepped into the breach and organized, and this was when Diane Nash was the coordinator, spokesperson of that effort, and they took up the rides. So what, what was the initial response to the Aniston bombing? How did Diane Nash and the leadership come to the decision to continue the rides against the wishes and the advice of so many? John Siegenthaler was among the naysayers. He said, many of us told them to turn back, that this was not the time, but they ultimately showed that we were wrong and they were right. Rip Patton said, we were keeping up with the rioters because of John Lewis. He had gone to Washington to join the beginning of the ride. We talked to them the night they landed in New Orleans at the hotel. They called back and they were talking to Diane and she said, well, we need to continue this. We can't just stop because if you stop it, then the enemy feels as if they had won the war. So we needed to keep going. Bernard Lafayette said the Freedom Rides were stopped because the people on the Aniston bus had smoke inhalation. They were in the hospital. It was just a very, very serious danger there. For had, they had set the bus afire. They tried to burn them. They held the door while the bus was on fire so the people could not get out of the front door. Other people prevailed on them, and no sooner had they cleared the door than the bus burst out in flames and was consumed by fire. It was a Molotov cocktail that had been thrown in the rear window. So there was no question that the people who made this attack intended to kill them, to roast them, okay? To cremate them, he said. That was the design. It was clear. Celine McCollum said, when the bus was burned in Anniston, we all immediately gathered at the church and started to talk about how we couldn't, just couldn't let this happen because that felt like we'd been beaten. That the, Ku, that the Ku Klux Klan had won, I guess is the best way of saying it. So we talked and talked and talked and decided that some of us would go. We couldn't just let the burning of that bus in Aniston be the end of the story. So we decided that we would leave from here. Lafayette said the bus got burned on Mother's Day. We had just negotiated the theaters open that, that previous Friday. So we were going to have a party. And Diane broke up the party and she said, wait a minute. 
So we sat there and she comes over with all this preaching stuff and we're sitting there looking kind of pitiful. And we got up and came on to the church and we were there all night until we got out of here the next morning. William Harbour says, I remember it real well. We were in a meeting and all night long we hassled and talked about it and said, we'll continue the freedom ride. Diane was there. We made several calls to Dr. King and everybody said, no, you're too young and it was too dangerous. But we had many students who wanted to go. I was selected, I think, because I was from Alabama. Anniston was 23 miles from my father's house. I think they wanted someone that knew about Alabama in case we got separated, in case things happened. John Lewis was also from Alabama and Catherine Burks was from Birmingham. Lafayette said there were 20 students who were part of the Central Committee, what we called it. We decided that as part of our strategy, rather than submit all of our folk to jail or being killed in the bus, because they still might have blown the bus up or whatever, that we would divide in half and we would take the first 10 and send them. And then we had a backup 10. They knew that whatever happened, the second team was coming. There was no stopping us because we were committed and wedded to each other as a family. So here they are, they've decided to go forward and to pick up the ride. And a lot of people are telling them it's a crazy idea akin to committing suicide. But there were also adults who were on their side. What did those supporters have to say? Reverend Will Campbell said, I played a very minor supportive role for which I'm grateful. I got to know some great people. The Freedom Rides, it was the Nashville kids that made that thing go. You know, after the others had turned back, they said, no, no, the ride's got to be completed. Ola Hudson said, just in donating meager funds to help them along the way. Because now in every mass meeting, offerings were taken and we ended up every Monday night, whatever you had, and those funds were used for the expenses of students and for the Freedom Riders and all of that. So I guess in the sense of that, all of us were a part of it. So now, no matter the level of support, once the decision is made to go, what could anybody do about it then, right? I found a great exchange between John Siegenthaler and attorney George Barrett from, from Barrett's interview. Apparently, Siegenthaler called Barrett to ask if he could help wave off the students to keep them from going into such dangerous waters. And Barrett says, I remember we were standing in front of Chuck Walker's office on Jefferson Street. He was a physician, and they'd sort of made his office a headquarters, and Diane and them were organizing. And I got a message to call John, so I stepped out on this payphone and called. I'm standing right out there at, at night on Jefferson Street. And Siegenthaler says, George. George, can't you do something about this? Barrett said, you're out of your damn mind, Siegenthaler. <laughs> Siegenthaler says, well, somebody's going to get killed. And Barrett says, well, I, I can't help that. And the interviewer pipes in at this point. She says, I wonder what he wanted you to do. And Barrett says, stop it, because somebody's going to get killed. And she said, well, they didn't seem to care from what I've read. Barrett said, no, they were very courageous. And I thought, you know, the time had arrived where people were either going to live in dignity or they're going to do something else. And you can't have a war like we had, the Second World War, make all these grandiose promises and have people come home to a segregated society. I mean, that's nonsense. Another angle to look at this decision, these are college students. So wouldn't they or shouldn't they be a little apprehensive about potential repercussions, consequences for taking such action, particularly those attending a public state college, Tennessee A&I, Tennessee State. And the timing of the events also prevented an another layer of dilemma on top of that. If we go now, we're going to miss our final exams. So Lafayette says, we decided to go early before school was out. We were in the midst of our final exams, but we skipped most of them because our strategy was that once the bus was burned in Anniston, we had to strike while the iron was hot, so we couldn't wait. It would have been great if we could have waited until school was out and go, but we thought that it was very important to keep the issue before the public. It was a media thing in one sense, because if you can get into the media 10 days in a row, you've got a movement. And frankly, had the initial freedom ride continued, we probably would have stayed in school until it was over. The Rip Patton said, I had no problem missing my exams. If I had taken exams, it might have served as a cooling off period and I might not have gone. Now there was even the possibility that the student might, might be expelled for something like this. Was that a deterrent, you think? Catherine Burks Brooks said, no, I had nine hours left. I knew I would graduate from somewhere unless I was dead. <laughs> You have to come grips with that early if you're doing something like this. Now, most of the people I'm talking about are of college age, but there were some younger folks who were even willing to go on to the very same lengths, you know, to risk their lives for freedom. Lewis Miller said, I was really consumed by the movement. That's really what I lived for. And when I say consumed, school became less important to me. 
The movement is what was motivating me. And when I would get in trouble at one school because they would find out that I had been arrested and that, you know, I was encouraging the kids to leave school and to participate in the movement and that I was on the central committee, then pressure was put upon the principal to deal with me. And so I would move on to another school. That's all they knew how to do. And when I got to Haynes High School, I must say that I enjoyed Haynes High because I was well received by the teachers, not by the principal, and I knew that was political. But the teachers let me know that they respected what I was doing. I was not only participating in the Nashville movement, I had begun to travel with them to other places. In fact, I was supposed to be on the bus with the Freedom Riders when they left, and they refused to let me go because I was so young. And I was terribly upset because I could not get on that bus. So now you've made the decision to go. Do you even tell your family about it? What kind of responses do you get from your folks? Did, did anybody have a situation the opposite of Mr. Miller when your school uh, uh, was not supportive of your involvement? Susan Wamsley said, my mom drew ads for Harvey's department store, uh, but she was the hero in all this. She encouraged me, supported me, and my sister. She had to be frightened. She could have lost her job. She said, I've always taught you that certain things were right. I guess I can't tell you not to do it now. As far as my friends were concerned, I had a couple of close friends who were in agreement. Some I grew up with didn't understand. One girl's father told her not to speak to me anymore. We had some bomb threats and other issues at home, but it turned out okay. Matthew Walker said, my father fully supported my participation in the sit-ins and the Freedom Rides. I was fortunate beyond belief. My mom worked in numerous capacities within the movement. Neither parent ever told me no. Rodney Powell said, Meharry, on the other hand, was absolutely not supportive. I ended up with Diane Nash, staying back in Nashville to help coordinate and provide administrative support. And the reason I did that was just because it was just before graduation, and I was told that if I were absent from graduation, my degree would be forfeited. I was told by one of the associate deans quite pointedly that if I was not there at graduation, if I were arrested, forget my degree. So after struggling through all this for four years, I had a few more days to go, and my internship at the University of Minnesota Hospitals was scheduled to begin July 1st, so I decided to stay behind. Now surely, Every one of you had to be afraid, you had to be scared. Carolyn Bush said, even after all these years, I can't remember fear. Even now, I can't remember being afraid. But there had to be an element of fear. Marion Fusan said, you really had the feeling of sigh, it says sigh in the transcript. You really have the feeling of, where did they get the courage for this? Because we knew, and they knew full well what it meant. When the Freedom Ride started, by that time, the students knew full well what was involved, and some even made out their wills before they went on the Freedom Ride. Selene McCollum said, well, there's always a chance of you dying. You don't ever see it that way, or at least that was not my perspective. Rip Patton said, I was on the third wave to leave Nashville. I don't think I could have survived mentally not going, knowing that Sue and Catherine were already there and what Jim's work said about what might happen. No way I was not going. John Siegenthal said, think of the courage of these children to literally take their lives into their own hands. You can't think about it without wondering what they've done to change this town and to change this nation. So you're all ready despite the fear. So what, would it, what was it that made you the ones to take, to take this on? Talk about your level of preparation and, and why you got involved. Rip Patton said, being a Nashvilleian with all the colleges we had, we had lots of out of state students, I figured, this is my home. Why should I let an outsider go downtown to sit in, stand in, swim in? So I joined the movement for that reason. The Lawson workshops instilled within us feelings about our fellow man turning the other cheek, the things we read in the Bible. The sit-ins were successful, drew us closer together. Diane said that we would continue the Freedom Rides, and we said, no problem. Matthew Walker said, I couldn't miss the workshops. I had attended Clark Memorial, Memorial United Methodist Church all my life. I was very impressed with Reverend Lawson. He made the workings of nonviolence very believable, using Gandhi as an example. But I got involved because I was black. That gives you enough ammunition, motivation, incentive to take whatever risk because nobody wants to live under those conditions. Susan Wamsley said students came to talk to us at Peabody College for the stand-ins. It was a movie theater protest tactic. We got interested, me and my sister, not completely sure what we were getting into, just felt it was the right thing to do. I basically knew no black kids all my life in Nashville. We saw how terribly unfair it was. Even those of us who were white had to clarify the fact that we could not ever experience what it was like to be black. We could always go back to our own neighborhood. 
Bill Harbor said, I guess it's something that I felt like I had to do. It was not planned on my part when I left Alabama. It just happened. So now it's time to go, but you got to get bus tickets. How do you get the tickets? Salim so McCollum said, the first thing, one of the funny, fun things about remembering that time was there was an adult group and a student group, and the adults always controlled the money. So whoever was the treasurer worked in a bakery and worked all night long, so we couldn't get any money until he was finished baking. Lafayette said, after the sit-ins, we didn't waste our resources. The next year, when we needed to carry the Freedom Ride forward, all the money from the sit-in movement, money that was raised during the whole period of 1960, was all in the bank. So then we had what we needed to buy all these tickets to keep the Freedom Ride going. It was not that difficult. They wrote the check, and then we had to buy the tickets. And then he says, of course, there was an interesting thing that happened. One of the signatures were not, was not on the check, and we had to leave. We were going on the Freedom Ride in the, the next morning. Now, adult leadership knew that we couldn't cash that check that night anywhere. It was $900. So they went to sleep on that because they knew we weren't going to get out of town. But what they didn't know is that there was a man who used to sell numbers, the numbers man. He says, not the book of numbers in the Bible. His numbers were different. <laughs> and, and he realized that this cause that we were trying to push forward was important. So he agreed that he would take the check, give us the money without the one signature. Leo Lillard was the one that stayed behind and did the office administration. So he went the next day and found the treasurer, got the check signed, and that way everything was copacetic. The problem was they didn't know that we, the students, had already left town. So they were very much concerned that we had. They were concerned for our safety. So who was this numbers man? What, do we know anything about him? Uh, Lafayette says, what was the guy? What was the guy's name? The guy, he was an ex-preacher down, you know, down on Jefferson Street. Good Jelly Jones. He was the money man, the bag man. Good Jelly Jones was his name. Rip Patton corroborates. He said, I think they got tired of listening to us as why we should go, and they gave us a check. We'd already told them what the fare would be for the Greyhound bus for the number of people we had going from Nashville to Montgomery, and, and they gave us the check. But we couldn't get it cashed. And we found a policy person, <laughs> a numbers runner, you might say. We told him what we needed and why, so he cashed the check. They figured we'd come back knowing that we couldn't cash the check, but the group had gone. They were already on the bus. Carolyn Bush remembers what it was like when they got to the counter to purchase their tickets. She said it was a white man that was issuing the tickets. And this is just so ridiculous when you look back on it, she says. He called a black lady up from the kitchen to come up to the counter, and as we brought our tickets, he told us how much it was. We handed the money to the black lady. She handed the money to him. <laughs> he issued the ticket, made the change, handed the money back to the black lady, and then she handed the ticket and the change to us. And that, that sounds hilarious until I think about one of the early experiences I had when I moved south in the late 80s from up north and in Atlanta, and I had the experience of having my change slapped on the counter and not being put in my outstretched hand. Right? So how did you all get on the bus without it being detected that you were traveling together? McCollum said we did not leave as a group, uh, as, a, as an announced civil rights group. Leo Lillard took me out on the bus route, and I actually boarded the bus, not in the downtown terminal, but someplace on the outskirts of Nashville to keep myself separate from the group and provide a little protection that way. Rip Patton said they were spread out between Nashville and Franklin. I think the last ride I got on at Franklin, so she wouldn't look like she was a part of the group. Carolyn Bush said, well, when we got on the bus, the black students went to the back and the white students sat in the front in the seats that were available. And once the bus pulled out of the station and started moving, then we would change seats. The white students would get up and move to the back and the black students would get up and move to the front. And once you made that move, they knew then that we were the Freedom Riders. They probably suspected it all along, but they knew then. And she says, I can remember that I sat behind a little girl, a little white girl during the trip and her mother sat beside us, behind us. The mother didn't really show any animosity toward me, but you could feel the tension that there was on the bus. But the little girl was not aware of the tension because she started talking to me, actually talking to me. And the two of us actually talked a long time. So you're along the way, and the first stop is Birmingham. Now, McCollum says, when we first got over the state line, we started seeing all these guys standing up and down the roads with their shotguns. But when we got into the bus terminal, they started putting paper up on the windows and covering the windows with something. Bill Barbie was at the front of the bus, and they started to beat him. And he was totally out of view of anybody except the passengers in the bus. And I just took my chances and started to scream and started yelling, oh, no, I can't stand it. Don't beat him. Oh, no, acting like a hysterical white woman. Her words, her words. 
And I can remember them pushing him aside and he fell down on the floor behind the bus driver's seat and these men saying, oh no, honey, it's all right, it's all right, nobody's gonna hurt you, it's okay, it's okay. And they never bothered him after that. Bill Harbour said, when we were taken off the bus in Birmingham, we stayed in the bus station half the night. And then Bull Connor said, we're gonna arrest you all for your own protection. So he took us to jail. And Lafayette says it was for protective custody. Their argument was that if they were allowed to go into the Birmingham bus station, the white people would come outraged and there would be a riot. And see, they would be the cause of the riot. So they were not allowed to get on, go and stay in there and they were arrested and put in jail. But they didn't stay. Catherine Burks Brooks says, and then he came and picked us up out of the jail, I guess about midnight. And I can remember refusing to leave the jail when I found out where we were going. And you know, we'd been taught if you don't want to participate to just go limp. And so that's what I did. I just had a seat on the floor and he had one of his guards to pick me up and put me in the car. So they're driving along in the car and having this conversation with Bull Connor. She says it was quite a calm conversation. And we got to Coleman, Alabama, which was a sundown town. Y'all know what that is. About two or 3 a.m. And we're just conversing back and forth. But I know when we get to Nashville, we're just gonna get some more money and go right back to Birmingham. I'm thinking we're going to Nashville, but Bull is planning to drop us out on the street in Ardmore, Alabama. Bernard Lafayette called it open rural clan country. And all of a sudden the car stopped and Bull and the other cops got out and threw all of our luggage on the ground and said, get out. They pointed at a building and said, there's a train station over there. And I, she said, I couldn't let him have the last word. She said, we'll see you back in Birmingham by high noon. She said, during that time, you know, we looked at a lot of Westerns and everything was gonna happen at high noon. <laughs> so of course, we walked over to what we thought was a train depot and we found out that it was a warehouse. So then we began to think, oh, well, maybe the Klan is coming for us. But we were lucky enough that the Klan was not coming for us and we went to look for a black community. Now, Harbor says, based on my experience living in Alabama, I knew that if we walked along down this railroad track, I could just about identify a black family house. If you played basketball in little small towns, you go across the track. That's where the black high school was located and all of that. So we walked along the railroad track and I saw a light in the back of a house, shotgun type house. So we went and knocked on the door. A black man comes to the door and he says, well, well, and we told him we were the Freedom Riders. And he looked up and he saw the other students, they had white students with them too. And he says, no, no, you can't come in. And he slams the door. Now, Catherine Brooks says, of course, he was afraid to open the door. And I remember what my mother had always said, you know, if there's a woman in the house, try to talk to the woman. And so I said, y'all, let's talk loud enough to wake up his wife. <laughs> and we did. And it was music to my ears when I heard her say, let them children in here. And then she opened the door. They opened up the door. Harbor said, we went in and she said, I know that y'all are tired and, you know, and so forth. You want something to eat? And we said, no, we just want to use the telephone and call Nashville and get us a car to come pick us up. And she said, no. She sent her husband up to town. She said, look, you go buy food for him. But she was also smart. She used the same kind of tactics we used during the demonstrations and the freedom rides. She told her husband, she said, you go up to buy food, but make sure you buy it from two or three different places. Because they know that we're not eating that much food. And we just went to town Saturday and got all our food anyway. So Patton said, and they called the office here. Leo Lillard and myself, we were at the office that night. And he was to ride on a little Studebaker Hawk, but that was a little too small. So he borrowed a larger car. And Brooks says, next thing you know, Diane Nash is dispatching young Leo Lillard in a borrowed station wagon. It was actually Susan Wamsley's mom's car. And she said, we didn't get back by high noon, but we got back there because he picked them up and took them to Birmingham, didn't bring them back here. We went straight to Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth's house. And Lafayette says, in the meantime, we were en route to Birmingham, so our plan was to have them get back in the cars and meet us back in Birmingham since they were on the way to Nashville, we thought. But instead, Bill we'll kind of put them out of the cars at the state line. So in the meantime, we're crisscrossing each other, one coming this way, one going that way. But we finally got there. Certainly by noon of the next day, we had all regrouped at Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth's house. From Birmingham, next stop is Montgomery. And Bill Harbour said, when we left Birmingham, we had two motorcycles in the front of the bus. We had a helicopter flying above the bus. We had two state troopers in the front and four state troopers behind. When we got to the city limits of Montgomery, everything disappeared. No helicopters, 
no state troopers, nobody. We pulled into the bus station in Montgomery and everything was just silent. Couldn't see anything, it was just real silent. And John Lewis said to me, Bill, this doesn't look good. Marion Fuson said, I met John Siegenthaler when he was Bobby Kennedy's representative in Montgomery. I had the chance to introduce him to the, one of the girls that had come from Peabody on the Montgomery trip. That was Susan Wamsley when he tried to rescue them. And they said, you better not try to save us because you'll be the next one. And 20 minutes later, he was on the ground. Bill Harbour said, we got beat up. It was bad, you know, it was real bad. Bus driver opened the door and got out and walked away. And we looked up, and it seemed like thousands of people in an instant came out of everywhere, waiting for us to get there. It was real bad. It was real, real bad. I think what really hurt me so bad, you had elderly folks, you know? Elderly white woman with, with ax handles. Just awful, you know? Not children, but I'm talking about people who should have known better. They just beat us up with sticks and ax handles and so forth. Just thousands of folks in the street. It was real bad. Black taxi cab driver pulled up. And we were trying to get the white students in the taxi cab. And he says, y'all, I can't ride white folks in my taxi cab. And the mob was just everywhere, and we're trying to get the students out, you know, so they wouldn't get hurt. But that was bad enough. Next night, we had a mass meeting. And Dr. King was there, and they started turning cars over in the street outside, and they said they were going to bomb the whole church and so forth. Dr. King was on the phone with Attorney General Robert Kennedy, and it was bad. We stayed in the church half the night, waited until the next morning when they deputized the National Guard and brought big trucks and took us out in buses and trucks to different places in the community. Bad night, it was real rough. James Bevel says, so this was the time when we were going through Montgomery and met the mob violence and that kind of thing, and, and then we were in jail in Jackson, Mississippi, on to Jackson. So that's why the first group was there. And the song, The Buses Are Coming, was sort of a hope that the other people would be coming behind us because we led the way for them. We didn't know what would happen to us, but we led the way in hopes that they would follow on our example. We hadn't intended to go to jail in Mississippi, because in the other places, they just beat us up and send us on. Even in Montgomery, we'd met with a mob, but they didn't arrest us. They had warrants out for us, but they decided it was best to pass us on to Mississippi, see what they would do. Brooks said when we got to Jackson, that's when everything totally changed. Sheriff, deputies, police, everybody were waiting for us. And when we got off the bus, we were arrested immediately, put into handcuffs. I can't stand to see anyone in handcuffs even now, because if you've, ever, if you've never been in handcuffs, it's a feeling that only someone who has been in handcuffs can truly understand. And you can imagine being in handcuffs and being surrounded by a crowd of people who you know just want to, who, who you know are just spitting on you and calling your names and throwing things on you and you're handcuffed and you've got to walk the, to the paddy wagon with this crowd around you and all of this going on. Harper said by this time we had students already from all across the United States getting ready to come from South Carolina, from everywhere, Central State University, South Carolina State, they were piling in. So we went on, got on the bus, went to Mississippi, got off the bus in Mississippi, police met us there and we walked in the bus station on the white side, says whites only, and they immediately arrested us and put us in jail in Jackson. Brooks said, once you got in jail, you were treated just like any other prisoner. You were fingerprinted, photographed, and we were placed in a cell. I don't remember how many people. I just think the cell was probably meant for about four people. And the girls, of course, put in one cell away from the boys. And I can remember a guard that used to come. I guess he was a guard, a little short white man. And every morning when he would come, I would ask him for a newspaper. And he would call me names and inform me that I was not going to get a newspaper. But every morning, I was still asking for a newspaper. And I can remember one morning, I don't know what happened. I was being taken out of the cell for something, and he closed my finger in the door. He didn't apologize or anything. And what I went out for, I was placed back in the cell, but I continued each morning to ask him for a paper. And one morning after that, he came down and he did not have a newspaper in his hand, but he had a newspaper in his back pocket. And he turned his back to me and allowed me to take the paper from his back pocket. So I guess even, she says, she says I guess even in the worst of us, innately there is some good in all of us. All of us somewhere somehow have a conscience. Even though you're doing what's wrong, I think somewhere there's a voice somewhere inside you that's telling you, letting you know what's right. So now, you, when you're in jail, do you have any kind of schedule? You know, what, what, what's, what's it like, you know, in, in jail? What are you doing in there? Harbor says, one of, the things, one of the things that we had been taught was that you really get up and do your exercise and keep your mind ready. We went on a hunger strike 
And the worst thing in the world is to be on a hunger strike and not have certain activities go on because, you know, you'll start thinking about food and so forth. So you had to have a planned day. And we had Bevel and Bernard and all of them. So they would want to talk to the, talk that religious type of stuff. So you got to talk something else. I didn't attend the theological seminary. He said, we had a lot of students from the seminary, but that kept us going. Bevel said it was logical. It made sense. What would happen if you don't, the guys would break down into teasing and telling jokes and you don't want that kind of atmosphere. You want to keep people in thought. And so that was particularly useful in the Mississippi jail on the Freedom Ride, that you just don't want people to get into uh, some, just feeling like they're just sitting on a corner, right? No, we're doing something. Oh, my thing is just going on here. And I'm, I had a technical snafu with my slide presentation, but I, I brought what I could. How do I get out of this, I wonder? It was actually pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's see. Okay, all right. Um, Bevel said we we didn't want guys to just be sitting around playing cards and checkers and that kind of thing in jail. Now Rip talked about Parchman and the depth of the punishment he endured for his courage. He said singing was important. They didn't like it. He said they hated it. They would take things away. You can take our mattress. He used to sing a song. He said you can take our mattress. Oh yes. You can take our mattress, oh yes. You can take our mattress, you can take our mattress. You can take our mattress, oh yes. And he said you'd add whatever word to that melody, whether it be the water or the heat or our toothbrushes or what have you. He said they would give us laxatives and turn off the water. And so they had to wonder how could we be in an institution like that and still be so spirited, right? That was our means of communication in the jail. We'd sing to each other, waiting for responses from different groups to, to see that they're okay. They gave us peace of mind, but it worried them. Harper said, oh yeah, we had all kinds of songs. The, the greatest singing was in Mississippi. <laughs> he said, someone told me that one, one night one of the five blind boys had put in jail with us. And one Sunday night, a voice started singing religious songs and pretty soon, two hours later, people from all around the community were standing around the jail. And it was really great. Up until the middle of the night, we were singing freedom songs. Real great. So what about when they let you out of jail? Lafayette says, so Bevel and I decided we were going to stay in Mississippi and mobilize people in Mississippi. And that's when we met Megger Evers. We were working on recruiting and mobilizing people from Mississippi to get ready to go on the Freedom Rides. And in a two-week period, we got 42 people from Mississippi to sign up. And then we were rearrested. They got out about five warrants for us for encouraging, encouraging juveniles to go and be arrested. And, well, Jackson, they didn't even have to catch the bus. All they had to do was go into the bus station on the white side and they got arrested. And that was considered the freedom ride. They never even took a ride on a bus except to the jail. That was the only ride they got. So now these folks have endured what is known to be the most notorious labor camp in, in Mississippi. Right? And Will Campbell says it's a wonder that they hadn't been killed. The Lord works in mysterious ways. If the forces in Jackson hadn't arrested them and taken them to parchment, for God's sake, with no charge at all, some of them were there for months. But if they had not arrested them and taken them to prison, I think there would have just been mass slaughter in the city of Jackson that night. I really do. Now, did you personally experience any violence, either you or those around you? And, and for the white people, how did the mobs treat you? Susan Wamsley said, I was scared to death. It was me that Siegenthaler was trying to get into a cab when he was bludgeoned in Montgomery. Jim's Zwerg got the worst physical treatment. I thought he was dead. I'd never even seen a real life fist fight before. When I participated in the stand-ins, we got called a lot of nasty names, but there was not a lot of physical violence. So I was not prepared for this kind of thing. It took me a while to realize how traumatized I was, nervous in crowds, etc. I'd never seen anybody really hate me like that even want to kill me just because of who I was with. And I would have wanted to ask if uh, you all have felt, you know, some sort of physical assault in some way. Were you ever able to confront any of those people? Was there ever any kind of opportunity for reconciliation? John Siegenthaler said, I don't want to see him again. I may not have been as non-violent as I was then. <laughs> Rip Patton said, no, I never had a chance to meet one. Catherine Burks Brooks said, no, I didn't have the, the opportunity to get back with Bull. 
<laughs> before he died, he tried to apologize to all the black people he hurt. And Matthew Walker said, I've been hit, but I've never seen any of the people who assaulted us. So now, how, how are you changed? How did, how did the Freedom Ride affect your lives? Rip Patton said, it, don't, it didn't only affect my life, but it affected this nation. Because I came back and immediately started getting into boycotts against Kroger and H.G. Hill. He just kept right on going. Susan Wamsley said, I learned that race didn't have to be a divider. I've passed the idea on to my children that if you see something that is wrong, try to do something about it. Individuals really can make a difference. If enough of us get together, we can change things. Don't ever just believe that that's the way it is. Ms. Brooks said, it exposed me to people that I wouldn't have met. I learned that history is so important. Matthew Walker said, showed me that in spite of the level of hatred we saw in Alabama and Mississippi, there was overall a great moral compass in this country. This nonviolent campaign was able to be successful in part because of its Christian basis. It struck a chord with so many Americans. We don't need huge resources to make change. And one can overcome fear. Anybody who said they weren't afraid are not truthful. You just have to face that fear. You can learn from other people. It inspired each of us to see others willing to take the risks that you're considering. And singing reaffirms the commitment, the connection, the high level of mutual respect for each other. So what can we do in the present time to continue to honor your legacy? Rip said, what I'd like to see next is to establish a nonviolent center here in Nashville, which has been the citadel of nonviolent leadership and knowledge. There's no coincidence that you have all these people in Nashville at the same time. James Bevel, James Lawson, John Lewis, Diane Nash, myself, C.T. Vivian, Bernard Lafayette. It was no coincidence. Lafayette says, we have a fabulous educational museum in Memphis. We have one in Birmingham, okay? They have one in Montgomery, Alabama, and one in Selma, Alabama, which is a very small community. I'm here because I'm curious about Nashville. What's the, what's the problem? We always make Nashville our first stop, but we don't have a museum. We don't have a center, an institution that could be an ongoing, permanent institution. So that's my challenge. I think what we have, he says, I think what we have at the Nashville Public Library is an important start. It makes an important statement, but we need an institution about the size of that library. So what about the impact of the Nashville movement on this city, on this country, and the world? Bernard Lafayette said those movements didn't stop in Nashville. The Freedom Rides, Birmingham, we name every movement that Martin Luther King was a part of. Look at there in Memphis, the very last one. You had Jim Bevel and myself, Jim Lawson, Diane Nash, all there. That's no coincidence, okay? So that shows you the impact of the Nashville movement. Nashville, of all places. Candy Carowan said, oh gosh, well, look at the leadership it produced. I mean, it started out in the sit-ins, but it had this strong core of people who were really going to go through the rest of their lives making contributions to the movement. And I think it had a lot to do with those trainings with Jim Lawson and sort of the foundation that was laid as people entered the Nashville movement. People like John Lewis and Diane Nash, I think they knew from the beginning, we're not just doing something for this spring, you know. We're embarking on something now that could change this country. And then went right on from the sit-ins to the Freedom Rides, moving down into Mississippi to work on voter registration. And then some have even moved on into Congress. And you know, they were trained and thought about it and joined together as a group to see a very long challenge. And most of them have stayed with it. What about some personal consequences? Family, how did that go? Bill Harper said, it's one of the things that people never talk about. Well, when I went on the Freedom Ride, my first two or three times in jail, and especially in Birmingham, when my picture was in the paper, my father and mother probably lived 60 miles from Birmingham, and they really caught it. My father was a supervisor down at the cotton factory, and they would come by and say, you know, your boy really messing up. They had to take the telephone out of the house because he got so many prank calls. And people used to drive by the house and sit there late at night. A lot of incidents happened. My grandfather was threatened. But my mother and father never, never said quit. When I left after 49 days in parchment and went back to Nashville to realize when I got back, a letter had come that I had been expelled from Tennessee State, signed by the governor. The court stated that several students' grades were not up to par. But one of the things that happened during the demonstrations, we got a lot of teachers in those schools, especially TSU, that 
really did not, I'm not saying they didn't agree with the movement, but they had their own job to protect also. And we left school and a lot of us didn't take the final exams. I came back and took my final exams, but a lot of students, they didn't get the chance to take the final exams and the teachers didn't give them a chance to take them because they were afraid. So what happened was when they left and went on the Freedom Rides and didn't take the final exams, that meant that their grades were lower. But I took my final exams. So I was one of the students that was put back into Tennessee State. Yeah. Now there were 14 who were expelled. They uh, eventually reconciled with the university. They were awarded honorary degrees. I believe four of them, for four of them it was posthumously. Uh, that was 2008 when they made up. And I got one more quote from Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Brooks about advice to coming generations. And she says, if your grandparents got out there and endured over hundreds of years of backbreaking labor for nothing, working, being beaten, being sold, if we went through the freedom rides, if we had sit-ins and the sit-iners, they had dogs sicked on them and hoses turned on them, and then you, this generation, sit here and read the results of all that, then tell me why you don't have an obligation to the next generation. You do have an obligation. You owe them something, and you owe big time. So to me, she says, the Nashville movement was, uh, there were many cities that were important, but if everyone could have had the spark to start the way Nashville did, and the commitment that those young people had that first year, it might even have changed the country faster than it already did. But I think that's extremely important. Now, there are a lot of gaps in the story that I was telling you today, uh, but you can come see me to fill in those gaps. <laughs> Not that I will tell you everything, but you can come and you can find resources in our collection that deal with these, these, this story, right? And uh, there are plenty of books. Uh, these are written you know, by, by great historians and uh, people who participated in the rides. Charles Person was one of the youngest Freedom Riders. Uh, this Raymond Arsenal book is really amazing. And uh, I have another one I've added to my list here. When I discovered that it was written, uh, co-written with our, our Natalie Bell uh, from the, the Fort Negley staff right out here, written Thomas Armstrong and Natalie Bell. And I think the, you know, there's some uh, younger, read, younger titles for younger readers as well. Uh, this, this Breach of Peace book is one that I want to look for because I, I think I need to own that. Uh, I should have brought it with me, man. It was, uh, I should have taken the, the Phil Ponder approach and had stuff to hand out. But it's a, it's a really awesome piece and it looks at people in, at least 50 years later and they have like their, their mug shot next to them from when they got arrested on the Freedom Rides and the, an occurrence shot of, of most of them have a current picture and just explain how people got involved and how it affected their lives. Uh, and also films, uh, you know, in, our, in our, our video video booth, we have films there that you can watch that will talk, talk to you about these stories as well. And uh, these oral histories that I've been talking about, where all these quotes came from, these are a couple of the movies here. And all, all these quotes come from our civil rights oral history collection. Uh, these are about a, more than 100 interviews of people, some connected to this story, uh, a lot connected to the sit-ins or to the story of school desegregation here in Nashville. And uh, at present, unfortunately, you have to come down and listen because they're still living on discs. We're, but if you know a, a fantastically rich uh, philanthropist who might be willing to help us digitize all this stuff so it can be accessible online, let us know. Um, but uh, in, the, in the meantime, you can come and listen. Or if you want to reach out to me, you can contact me, I can send you the list of all of the interviews and you can let me know which ones you might want to check out. And what I can do is send you a transcript. It's as simple as an email, it's just a little Word document. And I can send you a transcript that you can read the words yourselves uh, as opposed to coming downtown and dealing with traffic and our new state bird, the construction crane and all of that stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and of course, you can always come down at any time. Anytime the building is open, the room is open. And uh, you can come down and ask for me. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll be around. I can talk to you for a minute. Or if you reach out ahead of time, I'll, I'll set out a time and block time for you to talk with you. And uh, you can bring your family or you want to bring your, your job or you want to bring your church group or anything like that. We do all kinds of programming like that. 
and, and everything is always free. Uh, be in the public library, uh, the free, 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 a very low price. Um, thank you all very much. And uh, I'm sorry for my technical uh, snafu uh, today, but I uh, hope that everything worked out and uh, that the voices of the people who got on those buses uh, actually filled the room today. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. <laughs> Were the buses charter because buses usually pick up people on the way that were not freedom riders? Right, right. No, they, they didn't ride charter buses. They rode were, publicly uh, did they scheduled. Pick up, like people on the way that weren't freedom riders? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there were, there were more than just freedom riders on the buses, yeah. yeah. And they did? Yes. Okay. And then I went to Addison and the bus station, yes, yeah, a national monument or yeah. park. Yeah. It was really interesting, you know, the history and the mural yeah. and the entrance in the back for black people. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. None of y'all are old enough to know <laughs> anything about that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I remember. Yeah. It amazes me how brave the people were. Can you imagine? I appreciate that. Can you imagine being 19, 20 years old? Mm -hmm. uh, and you're going to set out and do something to try to change America. You know? yes. and, and you can't even vote yet. So you got, this, is, this is the avenue that you have. You could be 21. Yeah, couldn't, still couldn't vote yet. Yeah. I think James Lawson uh, and John Lewis are two of the finest Americans that ever lived. Oh. I, I would put John Siegenthaler. In well, that and too. I mean, he was an amazing leader, an amazing newspaper man. Yeah. Yeah. American heroes. Yeah. <laughs> I think, do you think that the, um, the thing on it, I'm not sure what you would call it, terrorism against like election workers and mm. jurors and people like that today, a lot of stories about that, plus uh, uh, resurgence of. Uh, voter suppression laws and that sort of thing. Do you think it kind of, um, would that be uh, part of our forgetting history or? Um, forgetting or suppressing or hiding or yeah. you know, however you want to, that's, that's kind of where, where, where the shirt today because I said freedom runners on This is for a different thing, it's about voting rights, but um, yeah, that, uh, we're fighting so many of the same battles, you know, 65 years later. And nowadays, I sit in there in our in our uh, in the Nashville room, and I can see this the state house up the street. That's right. <laughs> yeah, beautiful view, but you, you, I gotta wonder what's going on up there. With the shenanigans. Yeah. Well, how, yeah. how far have we come? Uh, looking at that particular building. <laughs> yeah, and still have so far to go. Yeah. But. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.